Welcome to what is officially, properly, the first episode of the Kaijusaurus podcast. Yes. I am Stephen Sloss. I am Ross Menzies. Uh, by now I hope, expect, you've listened to what was our pilot episode in which we reviewed the first episode of Spider-Man, but now we are embarking on what promises to be a truly kaiju-sized quest to watch and review all 30 films in the Godzilla canon. And we have begun, of course, in the only way you can possibly begin such a task, with the one, the only, Godzilla, released on November the 3rd, 1954, and directed by the legendary and sorely underrated Ishiro Honda. Ross, fire away. Well, well, the first thing to remember, guys, is obviously I have never seen the 1954 Godzilla. Stephen has, and he's also seen every single Godzilla film. Mm-hmm. Many, many times. Yes. Um, so I would say I really, really liked this film. I thought it was great. Um, obviously, I'm aware of what Godzilla means. Obviously, I'm aware of um, the sort of cultural idea behind it. But I really was just surprised like how natural this movie felt. Because it, to me, it has a lot of these sort of classic things that I would say come from a disaster movie or monster movies. And the thing that I love that it does is that it just unfolds so naturally. We open on essentially Godzilla emerging from the water and we really don't let up from there. And from that incident, we're just going to another incident. It's so much cause and effect. Absolutely. The, the, the ship incident causes people to go out to look for it. It causes more damage, more destruction, more attention. Mm, causes more ships to go out looking for the ships. Causes exactly. more ships to go out for more ships. And things eventually reach a boiling point. Ah. Uh-huh. Quite literally. Quite literally. <laughs> um, and a thing that I really appreciate about this film is, especially early on, it sort of just meanders along through these these causes and effects and sort of examines this tragedy. And while we get um, introduced to a lot of our um, characters who later on in the film will become very important and will form our sort of main ensemble, I would say very early on the film is sort of content to just show us the progression of this tragedy, the discovery of the missing ships, through sort of, I would say, a lot of group scenes. There are so many scenes, especially early on, with um, the people on the island, the the villagers on the island, with people in the map rooms very early on, and the guys in the communication centre. Um, and very early on, there's this, 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 this progression of information just being shared to groups. Absolutely. But no, so very early on, we are introduced to our characters. In a way that, 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 again, I say works very naturally. There isn't a big alarm bell that goes off when you first see Ogata that goes, this is our main character. In fact, I actually thought when they introduced Ogata and Emiko at the very start, um, for a sec, I just assumed they were these were two characters that were going off. Ogata says he's going off in his ship. I assumed he was one of the people that went missing in the second boat. Mm. I thought he was a character, that, a sort of red herring character that was just getting introduced. Mm. And even very early on, I was surprised just how very, like, very well characterised everyone is. Yeah. Like, because right off the bat, you have Emiko inviting Ogata to the Budapest Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. And he's like, no, sorry, darling, you, I have you, better you, things to do. You go by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> she does. And I, bet she, she, and I bet she had a really good time, to Lovely be honest. Lovely time, by herself. But I'm glad you brought up a point that the film opens with no clear protagonist because I read a theory, I'm sure it was by David Callett, um, I'm not totally sure, I think it was in his book, A Critical History and Filmography of Toho's Godzilla series, I'm not completely sure, I'll find where the theory was and post a link in the show notes. If you're but... wrong, you must beg for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Basically this theory is that this film shifts protagonists uh-huh. as it goes on. Uh, four protagonists, each taking a quarter of the film. The first quarter of the film, uh, our protagonist is Ogata, played by Akira Takarada, who will crop up in many more of these films, Ross. Mm. Uh, For the second quarter of the film, our protagonist shifts to uh, Dr. Yamani, played Mm. by Takashi Shimura. Takashi Shimura was an actor who, even by this point, was very, very respected in Japan. He was one of the top, top actors just under Toshiro Mifune, known for working with Akira Kurosawa, Ah. was in Seven Samurai, Yojimbo... Um, for his work in uh, Kurosawa's 1952 film, I think it was, Ikiru, the New York Times dubbed him 
the greatest actor in the world. Right. Because on that note, I thought his character was absolutely great. And again, just really quick, subtle characterization when he first mm. sort of steps up in front of the parliament, I think it is, mm. and just sort of fixes his tie that's all muffled. It's a great yeah. little moment, and it just actually brings so much out of a character that... You're so right. And then there's yeah. a little point later where he enters his house and he's all downtrodden, and he just bumps his head as he goes in. And it doesn't even register, and he's, he's just so focused on what he's thinking about. But yeah, Takashi Shimura, the New York Times, I think it was the New York Times, uh, called him the greatest actor in the world. Ironically enough, two years later, four years later, excuse me, when they reviewed Godzilla King of the Monsters, the Americanized version of this film, uh -huh. the New York Times, the same newspaper, deemed that of the cast of this film, not one of them could act. Well. <laughs> Stupid <laughs> racists. Well. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so yes, the next the, character. Yes, for the third quarter of the film, our protagonist becomes Eniko. Uh, played by a young, by this point, inexperienced actress called Momoko Kochi. And for our final quarter of the film, and for the film's finale, its final act, uh, the protagonist, and I would argue the protagonist of the entire film, becomes uh -huh. Dr. Daisuke Serizawa, uh -huh. played by the criminally underrated character actor Akihiko Hirata in undoubtedly his finest role. Mm hmm yeah, no, because I, I, I could definitely agree with that. But I think the also the the, the thing that I felt at least was that the the sort of similar in like chunks of four, maybe I don't know that the the film did go through some sort of uh, it's very solid sort of quarter progression of the the sort of like progression of Godzilla of this tragedy because mm -hmm. very early on our our first sort of chunk is is essentially the discovery of of Godzilla Absolutely. the initial sort of um the, yeah the disaster awareness. Of what's going yeah. on the second chunk as you're putting it could be you know uh find Godzilla yeah How do we deal with Godzilla? And, and or I would say at least that's when um, you have Professor Yamani come in mm. a, a, a stronger sense of like understanding Godzilla where did he come from yes what what is he trying to do well uh, and then I would say third one is obviously destruction. Yeah, absolute escalation. Yeah. Um, this sort of futile attempt to, to stop Godzilla, to destroy Godzilla. The rampage in this film, you, you'll see many rampages mm. as we make this journey through these films, but this one is utterly apocalyptic. It really it's is. Horrifying. The scenes that, the, the, the shots that really stick out to me are these. Uh, long shots where we're just looking over to Tokyo and it's just it's bathed in flames uh -huh. the entire landscape and just making his way slowly in the in the in the distance is Godzilla completely in control in command mm -hmm. of this situation it's terrifying yeah absolutely another shot of sort of destruction that I thought was absolutely like beautiful is when Godzilla is coming up through the bay, the waves are crashing, and right behind the waves is just the flames of, mm. of the surrounding buildings. And the waves aren't even, they're not crashing particularly like strongly. They don't look so aggressive. They actually kind of look calm. But it just, because they're coming at such a way, it looks absolutely great. I agree. But um, going back to this idea of... Um, sort of finishing up on Dr. Sarah's hours sort of personal story yes, which that, I say that, would, that would is the sort of final, final yeah. bit of that um, which I really like because again as I say the this sort of personal stuff it, it, it enters into this mm. progression very very naturally because about in the middle of the film is when we start to even I, I didn't realise at first that Ogata and Emiko aren't officially together yes I mean and I think the the fact that Emiko is actually is it betrothed sort of vaguely yes the, yes she's betrothed to Dr. Serizawa um, it's implied that Serizawa uh, was either a student or a colleague of Dr. Yamani which would make sense and a uh, childhood friend of Emiko and they've been uh, arranged to be married since mm. they were children but now Emiko has met Ogata and has fallen in love with Ogata in a much more natural love story. She mentions that she just, just, uh, has always seen Serizawa as a brother. Yeah. And although it's absolutely clear in a brilliantly, just subtly conveyed performance that Serizawa is still absolutely enamoured uh -huh. with Emiko. And Serizawa, I mean, what a character he is. Absolutely. It's just such a... 
like so intense, these dark eyes, mm. sweat dripping off him almost constantly. It would be easy to uh, it would be easy to draw comparisons with him being a mad scientist. What was the eye patch? And he's a bit of a recluse in the uh. long white lab coat, but he's not. You know, he they, really isn't. They ground all these tropes. They mention that. Uh, the guilt over Emiko and Ogato's relationship. Serizawa went through so much during the war, uh-huh. he lost an eye. Well, yeah, and beyond that, um, like Serizawa has a very strong, clear moral code that he outlines very early on. He's very, he's not a mad scientist. He's, in many ways, he's desperately trying not to be. He's a sane scientist. Yeah, he's, a, he, he's aware that... Um, oh, he, he's he's aware that he has the capacity to yeah. become that. Exactly. Um, no, and I, I absolutely agree that his relationship with him, Emiko, is like absolutely great to watch. Mm. It just is so it is so interesting because it, it, that actually was something I was wondering. Is like, does he like her? Does mm. he does he have these feelings about her? And yeah, I think very subtly, yes, yes, he does. One of the most interesting scenes in the film to me, and one of my favourites, is when uh, just before the film's climax, Emiko and Ogata. Uh, go to Serizawa's house and plead with him to use a new weapon of Serizawa's invention called Ah. the Oxygen Destroyer, which turns oxygen particles in water into fluid and destroys any living being caught up in the surrounding area. Which is so grim. Which is (laughs) horrifying. Yeah. Um, So uh, Serizawa refuses... Uh, not wanting to take responsibility for any moral implications that might uh, come from the weapon, and indeed not wanting them to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ogata and Emiko aren't taking no for an answer. Uh, Ogata bursts into the room, and we hear a, a scuffle. But the camera, in one of Honda's best moments in the film, the camera just slowly pans down, and focuses on a fish tank, uh-huh. and we only hear the fight. And next thing we know, Emiko was helping a battered Ogata <laughs> yeah. up. And that's a great moment because it's so open to interpretation. First of all, it's established Serizawa was in the war. Yeah, he but, can fight. Ah, uh-huh. exactly. He's, he lost an eye. To put it lightly, <laughs> he's seen some shit. Yes, exactly. Through his one eye, he's seen some shit. <laughs> But then, um, <laughs> over and above that, I've said this to people before, and they seem to agree once I've said it to them. I take this as not only is Serizawa sort of just fighting off Ogata and ah. resisting the use of the oxygen destroyer, he's, in a way, whether he's aware of it or not, physically punishing Ogata ah. for what he sees as taking Emiko from him. Yes. That is how I interpret the scene. Oh, totally. Um, I've just thought of it just now, but could it also be... It is right after that scene that he sort of relents to them both and Absolutely. says, I will he, use... The he sees the TV broadcast of the song, yeah. the Pray for Peace. But exactly, but what I was going to say there is that he, he sort of relents and goes, okay, I, I realise that we might need to do this. Immediately after he batters someone. Yes. Immediately after he himself has used sort of As violent force, force yeah. Yeah, to, um, to deal with the situation. Um... Before we go on ahead to that broadcast, which is absolutely, like, that scene, that sequence is it's, absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most, if not the most powerful sequences yeah. in the entire film. And, indeed, in the entirety of Kaiju cinema. Exactly. Because while, so while we're on, on the discussion of this sort of trio, um, of, of this sort of central relationship, I like how that love triangle doesn't properly emerge until about the middle of the film. I like that because had that been starting very early on, I would have been concerned, or not concerned, but I, in the back of my mind, to be going, why am I focusing on this? Absolutely. There's a greater tragedy unfolding. But like we said, because Godzilla is happening first and foremost, mm. and it is in the front of our minds, by allowing this um, Emiko and Ogata's concerns about mm. Dr. Serizawa personally to sort of filter through, it just raises the stakes in a way, because yep. it comes... Yep. In at the end, because it comes in after. It gives us a reason to want them to keep pushing. You're absolutely correct. And you're, you're so right because, like you say, the love triangle isn't pushed on the audience at the very beginning. Uh-huh. Like maybe it would be in an American science fiction film of yeah. this time, or, or in one of Godzilla's contemporaries. But 
It's very naturally revealed through the film and it masterfully lets the audience know that the lives of these four people are very much intertwined with the appearance of this apocalyptic monster. Exactly. And it's a film that has very large it has a very large scale, it has very large scale implications, but it's also an intensely personal film. Yes. As we follow these four people and by extension uh, Shinkichi, a character who is uh, an islander from from Odo Island, ah. and well, I really, who, who, oh, sorry. who is relatively important in the film's first act, but becomes a supporting slash background character as the film goes on. Yeah, but, um, um, I want to jump on to Odo Island, but very quickly, I'm going to go back on mm-hmm. my final thing about Serizawa and uh, Amiko is I love their first full scene together in Serizawa's lab. Yes, it's such with a, the newspaper report. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, th- that as well, but once the two of them are alone in the lab, I love that scene. It's such a sort of long breath of fresh air mm. where the, the, the sort of impending tragedy or, or the impending horror of, of, the, of the coming Godzilla attack, mm-hmm. to me at least, took a back burner very naturally to me being really worried about whether or not Amiko was going to tell Dr. Serizawa yeah. about the relationship. <laughs> that was that was the number one priority on my mind. And it, it goes to show just how expertly that is used, because like we just said, had that been the first thing we're introduced to in the film, I actually wouldn't have cared about it as much. Mm. Because... Obviously, we haven't even touched on Godzilla yet, but well, exactly, exactly, yeah. which is because which is great because obviously I am just so compelled by these mm. like characters. And Momoko Kochi and Aki Kohorata are so great together because without it being having ha- without it having to be explicitly stated again, as it might be in a Western contemporary of this film, um, we really get the impression that Emiko is the only person who can really talk to Serizawa, ah. who can really who can really get any sort of response out of him. Absolutely. Um, we just knows... We knows how to speak to him. I mean, he is in his shell. And ah. he's staying in his shell. <laughs> yeah, he, he does not come out for that He might movie. poke his head out for him. <laughs> exactly. I mean, he, he basically says as much uh, right near the end where he, where he explains that he wouldn't really confide uh, his research with anyone else. Mm. Um, but no, I... Their relationship is really great, and but the, the the first sort of plot or or setting that I found myself being really involved in was Odo Island. Yes, I like that after the sort of first five minutes with um, this constant stream of disappearing shift uh, ships, and I think I feel like the counter for that movie just increases as the film goes on mm. because we start off with one missing shift ship. Uh, ship. We've got to two missing ships, we've got three missing ships, then we're at 17. <laughs> <laughs> they do just drop that one, but 17 ships missing. I'm like, oh, oh shit. What? The counter's going ding, 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 ding. But I agree, Odo Island is great, and again, we're not given any uh, expository dialogue or anything saying, the last ship was lost off the coast of Odo Island. We just suddenly find ourselves on this island and dozens of these islanders are just sitting on Mm -hmm. the beach looking out at the ocean, looking out at this vast, horrifying ocean and it's a really effective scene. Yeah, I I very quickly, off the back of that, I want to talk about the blocking of uh, a lot of the scenes Mm. Um, and I really, really love the blocking and there's this sort of recurring thing that I noticed there are so many shots in in this film, in Godzilla, of of a large group of people gathered around something. Yes. There is a um, the the people gathered around the the people of Odo gathered around the the beachfront. The the communications guys gathered around um, their map room yes. at the very start of the film. Doctors gather around their patients. Uh, ch- the children gather around their mother near the end of the film. Yes, and again we have the, the Odo Islanders and the research party charging up the hill to to face Godzilla. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, and it ties into this to the, I guess this thing that I felt like there is so much of this film that is just focusing on on groups of people. R- until the the Serizawa, Ogata, Emiko sort of love triangle, yes. there is no real. Everybody is getting told the information. Really. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no like 
privileged individual that's doing all the research. Absolutely. That is gaining all the information. The closest example, obviously, is the main character in the, the most recent Godzilla American remake. Yes. Ford which Rose is the absolute Rose. opposite of this. We have one character going through the entire journey, yes. gaining all the information and being involved in every single facet mm-hmm. of that. And there's even that great scene in this film... Uh, in the Diet Building, the Parliament Building, mm-hmm. where Dr. Yamani has made his report and he's, he's told everyone about the very nuclear aspect of Godzilla and how a very clear and present danger uh-huh. it represents. And we have a, 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 a grumpy, mustached gentleman saying that this should be kept secret from mm-hmm. the public because it's just too dangerous and it would send them into a panic. But we have... Um, a women's group on the other end saying no that's exactly why it should be made public this is too dangerous to keep secret exactly and there's oh it's there will be many times during this discussion where I will just be at a loss for words at how much I love this film he but just shuts his eyes <laughs> yeah just shut my eyes and take it in oh but that scene concludes with both of those parties just yelling at each uh-huh. other and uh, back and forth, and it just ends with the Yamani and his group looking down onto the ground solemnly in disappointment. And yeah. it's just unstated characterization. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> what I love is that there's, there is a great balance between our sort of main ensemble, which I am going to now dub hashtag Team Yamani. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> But no, as I say, there is... T- team Sarazawa breaks away from Team Yamani. <laughs> exactly. And then, oh, and then we've got Team Odo... Ver- uh, not Team Odo, sorry. Team Ogata versus Team Sarazawa. <laughs> it gets very difficult. <laughs> no, so what I really enjoy is that we can focus on our sort of main character ensemble while simultaneously visiting so many different groups of characters, so many different individuals. We spend so much time in Godzilla with people we don't know, mm. in rooms we don't know, in, in sort of building, just visiting, sort of slice of life almost, yes. how different sections of, of Japanese society, of, of different organisations are dealing with the Godzilla crisis. Yes. We go from... Um, the island of Odo, to the Japanese parliament, to a mother and her children on the street, just visiting people that we don't need to know personally, but we just want to see their reaction to these things. They're so compelling. The mother cradling her children amidst Godzilla's rampage and telling them that they will soon be joining their father, they will soon be where their father is, Mm -hmm. is one of the most harrowing things I've ever seen on film and it stands up there as personally to me not only one of the the most defining moments of this film the Godzilla series but kaiju cinema in general and if I want to take it further which I do anti-nuclear cinema oh, absolutely. of which this film is a prime example yeah well I mean that's a great opportunity to talk about that mm. essentially it's the message is not subtle. Oh yeah, the message is not subtle, but it's also not particularly. Um, what the, I don't even want to say forced because I don't necessarily think that a forced message is a bad message. Absolutely. Or that, or that a clearly stated message is forced. Yes. I think the movie is clear what it's about, but it's also very obviously about much more than a single issue. You're absolutely correct. It, it draws on that issue and explains how that if it, how that issue essentially mm. affects. Japan, how it affects any everyone from it, yeah, the people of Odo to the Japanese parliament. You're absolutely right, because what I was going to say is this, the, the anti-nuclear message is not subtle, and quite rightly, it shouldn't be, it doesn't need to be. To contextualise this film, this film was released in November the 3rd, 1954, less than a decade after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This was still very, very raw for Japan open discussion of this subject was it wasn't taboo but it wasn't openly encouraged it wasn't exactly dinner party fair Mm. to see this subject tackled in such a broad and daring way in a huge mainstream film was nothing short of revolutionary Uh and I would say, I made this point in my dissertation I wrote called Gojira Mon Amour, 
that, that this is very much a therapeutic film. It's not talking down to the Japanese people. It's, it's not condescending them. It's throwing these issues out in the open and saying this wasn't okay. Mm. We have so many great scenes in this film that openly discuss what happened to this country. Uh -huh. Chief among them is that brilliant little otherwise completely incidental scene with three characters that we haven't seen before, we don't meet again, two men and a woman on a train discussing what's going to happen if Godzilla attacks. Uh -huh. uh, the woman says, I just barely survived Nagasaki and now this. And uh, one of the men says, uh, evacuate Tokyo, I don't know if I can go through that again. Open discussion, and it's was and is still very bold. Yeah, absolutely. That that scene, that, which I thought was great, because mm. it is it again. It, it, it harkens back to this slice of life thing. I'm absolutely, about, or... the, the slice of life elements of this film are so natural because um, before this, director Ishiro Honda uh, directed a lot of sort of slice of life uh, films about family life, mm -hmm. and that's evident in this film. We haven't talked about Godzilla yet. <laughs> no, we haven't. I mean, it's a testament to this film that we could discuss so much of it without discussing the title character. Yes, exactly. The fifth protagonist. <laughs> the fifth one, yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, and I guess we can just start, well, where do we want to start? Maybe with the opening shot of Godzilla, mm. of, of seeing him for the first time. Well, we, we first get our first glimpse of Godzilla on Odo Island... Uh, amidst the thunderstorm when Shinkichi uh, runs out of his house to investigate the cause of the storm or uh -huh. what this huge noise is uh, unwittingly leaving uh, I, I think his brother and his mother inside who are then uh, crushed crushed uh, poor kid but poor kid our, <laughs> our first real look at Godzilla and There we go again. It's great. He's done it again. He's done it again. An icon is born when Godzilla rises from behind that hill on Odo Island and peers over at the villagers in the research party. Because up to this point, I think this is again another point that David Callot makes in his audio commentary on... Oh, it's worth mentioning that for this, we watched the Criterion Collection release and with with specifically their subtitle track. It is a different subtitle track from other releases and it's the most up-to-date and, as far as I'm concerned, most accurate. Anyway, Thanks. David Callett makes... <laughs> <laughs> For your health. <laughs> For your health. David Callett makes the point that um, the Odo Islanders in this scene, when the bell has been rung, uh -huh. which is a great moment as well, oh. and they say, oh, Godzilla's on the other side of the hill. They're all running up. With pitchforks, yeah. spades, <laughs> guns, rifles. They're ready to go. They're going up there to fight mm -hmm. what they think is probably at most a dinosaur. Yeah. They're going up there to fight a monster. And then when this huge fucking leviathan yeah. peers its head over, there is one of my favourite moments of acting in the entire film. Godzilla looks over the hill and... Everyone in that scene instantly recoils. <laughs> yeah, because it's such a great scene, and him just coming up, and it's over that over that hill. It's over that like dry grass. It's like dry mm. brush. It looks great, and it's strange because the sense. I'll, I'll sort of open this up for discussion, or at least for your for your thought, sort of opinion, is that watching this film and especially that shot of Godzilla sort of almost just peering through like peering above dry grass mm. he looks sort of just like a wild animal like a bear like something mm. immediately it's something that is just a natural thing like a very as natural as yes. a wild animal something you don't fuck with a wild bear you don't fuck with Godzilla <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I want to bring that up because obviously I'm aware of of the of, the sort of Godzilla canon and something I'm just not quite sure of is how 
and I'm thinking what the way how much of a character Godzilla is like how mm. as these films go on do we is it sort of like there's there are some Godzilla films where he's very much more a uh, sort of um like a natural force are there are there films where he's we were sort of getting oh, a clearer yeah. sense of his goals, his desires, etc. Godzilla's characterization does vary, but the most defining traits of Godzilla, to me at least, are uh, that he never gives in. Uh, he doesn't back down from a fight, despite any odds. Um, but in this film, the phrase I like to use when discussing Godzilla's characterization is vengeful god mm-hmm. that is absolutely how I see him in this film he is he cuts a path of destruction through this huge metropolis in an almost biblical act of punishment Uh huh. punishment for uh, who knows uh, scientific progress gone too far um, is it a very personal punishment? Your weapons did this to me. Uh-huh. Now I'm going to do this to you. Do it back, yeah. Which, which I think is like a really interesting way to look at it. And obviously, I'm I'm essentially looking forward to seeing mm. each and every Godzilla film. Well, yes, so that I can, and so I, so I can obviously start coming at it from the, the sort of contact, the, the context from you. That so that I can start coming at it from the context that you have because. Essentially, watching it fresh, watching it for the first time, the vibe that I got or the vibe that I felt was very much more of this sort of natural force kind of idea. Yes, which, which is reiterated in the Gareth Edwards 2014 film. Yeah, which yeah, nature. exactly. Which is 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 that vibe that they're going neutral for. force of nature. Yeah, that can swing either way. Oh, totally. But as you you are right, as the films go on, Godzilla's characterization varies, and he will become increasingly. Uh, anthropomorphised and humanised and will take on more human-like traits. Which isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at Because you have Godzilla. You know, the Mm. the characterisation of Godzilla in Godzilla does not go away. Does not lend itself to a franchise. Pardon? Um, What I'd say is that the characterisation of Godzilla in the original film does not exactly lend itself to a franchise. That's true, to be honest. Mm. If I couldn't really see lots of films like that existing, (laughs) but I, I, I know there are and I know that they're different, but... That is not a bad thing. I think, I guess that's one of the best things about it. Is uh, absolutely, because I, I am biased. I, I openly admit this, but to me, the Godzilla franchise is one of the most tonally rich and varied in the history of popular cinema. Exactly, because you don't want 25 plus disaster movies. Yeah. Can you imagine watching <laughs> 30 films <laughs> with the same tone as this? Oh, 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 God. I mean, what, this is leads into a point I was going to make to you because I've shown I've, I've consciously shown this film to a lot of people like saying okay sit down with me and watch this film and get ready to have your ignorant preconceptions shattered boom but, which is what you did to me because we've been friends for what six years seven years like seven plus seven like midway through high school yeah mid- well, midway through high school yeah. and we're now we're now university. we're now not at high school we're now anymore. university graduates Ooh, um, doing, and have been doing a Godzilla podcast <laughs> Woo. but no um, I've shown this film yeah, yes as I was saying I've shown this film to many people just consciously sat them down and say okay watch this film with me and the one thing that everyone I've shown this to has said to me on some level, is that holy shit? This film is a downer. It is, but I works I, to its favour. You no, know, no, it absolutely works to its yeah. favour, and I think there are there are definitely um, there are definitely parts of the film that sort of lighten up the tone a bit. Mm. And I would actually say the scene in the train car is one of them. Like I thought, it, it, it alleviates tension yeah, really nicely. Despite what they're talking about, it's it's a great little scene. They're just mm. three. Sort of young characters in a train car just chatting amongst themselves, mm. life going on for them. Exactly, is normal. yeah. And it, it and it's comforting to see. So it's, I wouldn't say it was a downer film. I would say definitely it, it's fairly stark. Mm. But I'd say it's not trying. It's not trying to depress me. It's just trying to make a point. It's just trying Absolutely, to be honest yeah. about a thing. A thing that just naturally is going to sound a little bit of a downer. <laughs> can't really reach this tone without it.
Okay, what I wanted to discuss now uh -huh. is um, the big issue that usually um, lends these films a really unfair stigma. The special effects. Ah. Uh -huh. Give me your opinion on the special effects. Of course, Godzilla was portrayed by an actor in a latex costume, Haruo Nakajima, um, who went on to play the role until 1972, and again is still very much with us. Mm. Uh, he's very active on the convention circuit. Oh, excellent. Which is, which is very cool. Um, Have you encountered him? No, unfortunately, but I hope to. One day. Um, and Haruo Nakajima in the Godzilla suit tramples through a uh, miniature Tokyo, and over and above that, we have a lot of, which I'm not to put down your ability, but a lot of uh, really brilliant mat work that I'm fairly confident you will not have even noticed no, in mat work I because didn't. I didn't until I got <laughs> this criterion set. No, I absolutely did not. So, well, to answer your question, I'll say that essentially while I was watching it, I was I was thinking that question. I sort of thought you'd maybe ask or, mm. or that would come up because I thought the model work is great. Obviously, it is, obviously it's not a modern film. Obviously, it's not. <laughs> Does it matter? I don't know. The, the model work, I thought, was really, really great. Um, yeah. I thought it was absolutely cool. The the sort of train wreck sequence, That's especially, scary, was, yeah. was absolutely brilliant. Mm. And like I said, did absolutely not notice the mat work. The other thing I thought looked great was the house collapsing. Uh, on Odo Island? Yes, yeah. on Odo Island. I thought that looked great. And the, 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 they take a long time with it, too. It's, uh, dust falls and then a few uh, a few a few planks start to fall. And yeah, the house starts to it shake. sort of shakes and yeah. twists and it's it, 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 it really does look great. But it's no, I a huge set being manipulated. Yeah, right? which is great. I yeah no, I have no, I have absolutely nothing but respect uh, for I, for the special effects work. I'm so glad to hear that because this this is one of these things that it does stop. Uh, a humble kaiju fan from ah. sharing his passion <laughs> with the world. He is ignored, yes. unloved, <laughs> a, par a pariah, if you so will. So many people in this world are just ignorant and are unwilling to open their minds <laughs> to anything that's not Ray fucking high has in stop motion. Mm. But I digress. Yes, <laughs> but no, I, I. It's an argument we. It's an argument you get with any old film, and oh, it's absolutely unfounded as well. And it's just, I don't. There's, it's difficult to formulate a response that isn't get over yourself or exactly. or get a grip. Yeah, get a grip or like be more. Be, just understand the context. Yeah. Obviously, it's not. Obviously, it's not got modern production values because yeah. it's not a modern film. Exactly. End of story. Special effects director. E.G. Tsuburaya, who will come up many, many, many more times in our discussion. Glad to hear him. Um, arguably, arguably the single most important figure in the history of the kaiju genre. Totally. Absolutely. Um, For a film that's sort of built fundamentally on on that, mm. on, on special effects. Mm -hmm. Or not fundamentally, but on uh, uh, through which special effects play a, a sort of key role. Absolutely. Tsuburaya was a huge fan of King Kong, the original, 1933, and was inspired when seeing it in Japan to go into special effects. He, <laughs> there's great stories about him during World War II. He did a couple of war pictures with the miniature uh, warships and planes and this sort of thing. And allegedly, the US Armed Forces were interested in him at one point or wanting to investigate him or did investigate him mm -hmm. at one point because they thought his... His World War Two battle footage was so realistic that they were convinced he was a spy, filming things on the sly. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. But E.G. Mr. Subaru wanted, did want to use stop motion for this film, uh -huh. um, like as was used in King Kong, but budget and time. Yeah. No way. No way. No budget. Matter. And the time they had to get this film out. Not a rushed film by any means. No, no. But it had a release date. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just, film's got to come out. Um, <laughs> like you said, it's difficult to formulate a response to people who derive these special effects because this isn't a Hollywood production. No. E even contextual, uh, contextualising it in the early to mid-50s, this is not a Hollywood production. Ah. This is a much more... Uh, not humble, but a, a much more 
Well, I think you've said enough. It's not Hollywood. Exactly. Yeah. Capital N, capital H. Exactly. Not Hollywood. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, but uh, right off the back of that, I feel... I want to mention, this is very briefly, and some could say a tangent, but I want to talk about <laughs> a specific actor... I want you to tell me if you know anything about him. Okay. The old fisherman in Odo <laughs> That man looked amazing. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because the Odo Islanders, the actors playing them and the extras they have, they have such great faces. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're so like, all the faces are really storied. They're like crevice. Absolutely. Lined. It's, it's kind of like Sergio Leone in his spaghetti westerns. He would always fill his... He would always fill his towns with these really interesting looking people who just had really distinguished looking faces and really mm. interesting storied faces, uh-huh. like you say. And this is this is the same here with the Odo Island villagers. That actor who is just great. He's <laughs> so great. And another thing I'll I noticed feed you ignorant cows to Godzilla. <laughs> another another thing about that scene that I really like is while he's telling I think he's telling the journalist about um, the original story of Godzilla, the sort of traditional story. Yes, there's a, they're watching a traditional dance. Yeah. So this is all that's left of our ceremony. Uh, there's a woman in the background that just sort of keeps glancing at him, and I just I almost yeah, started laughing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because she's actually, she's sort of got a really neutral expression, but I sort of like to imagine that she's just sort of watching this conversation and just being like, oh, fuck up. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. But <laughs> Also... Well, actually, no, I'll let you continue. With regards to that actor, like you asked, um, I don't know overly much about him. Um, I don't have his name at the top of my head, but I, I, I've i done so much reading about this film that it just rattles around in my head. Um, I'm sure I read somewhere that he worked a lot with Kurosawa. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, like a lot of actors at this time did, and he continued to do it well into the 60s. Another character I want to talk about that I think... Um, encroaches this sort of lightness that we were talking about that there are a lot of really funny el- or light elements is the journalist uh, Hago- um, Hagiwara Hagiwara played yes. by Sachio Sakai who again you will see many more times absolutely fantastic and my favourite scene of him a scene that I thought was sort of simultaneously actually really compelling and quite emotional but also kind of funny was the scene where he's standing on top of um, the media tower. Is that him or is that another No, journalist? that's a different journalist. Right. But I'm so glad you brought up the TV tower scene because that is a brilliant it scene. It really is. Yeah. Because this this reporter... On, maybe it would have been more emotional or more powerful had it been Hagiwara. Good point, Ross. You just ruined this film for me. Whoops. <laughs> Whoopsie. No, but I, no, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I just think it's a great scene because I... I well, again, it's a character we didn't know before. We don't exactly. Know, we don't know again. There we go. Uh, just commenting... Not, not quite learned. slice of life. But, not um, quite slice of life. But, yeah, but just documenting Godzilla's rampage, saying, okay, Godzilla is getting close now. He's very close to us. He is crushing the tower. Goodbye. He's crushing us. <laughs> yeah. Well, because then, at the very least, it ties into that argument between the public and private. Should we, um, should we let people know what's happening to God? Uh, should we let people know what's happening, or should we keep it a secret? And that clearly argues in the favour of everybody should know what's happening at, at, at any given moment. We need to keep the people informed. So this journalist mm. dies. And up to the moment he dies, he is informing the public of what's Absolutely, happening. He yeah. is trying to let everybody know what's the, going the on. The line I love is, if you're just tuning in, this is not a film or a play. This is real life. Yeah. That's, that's Which is great. great. <laughs> but no, then, um, well, I'll take what I said about that being... Um, what I'll say is that when the journalists show up again near the end, and they're all gathered yes. around the boat, before uh, anyone's died, before Serizawa and Ogata have dived, I like there's so many of them just crowded yeah, around the side, a, just but, shoving but cameras down. there's only down. one commentary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, just rattling off what's going on. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, to bring it back to another discussion, Serizawa agrees to use the oxygen destroyer. He and Ogata uh, descend to the ocean floor. Mm-hmm. Serizawa taps Ogata on the shoulder telling him it's okay you can go back up to the surface ah. I've got this and in this moment uh, Godzilla awakes at the ocean floor approaches Serizawa Serizawa holding the oxygen destroyer above his head 
detonates and drops at Godzilla's feet. And while this is going on, Ogata has been pulled up and is screaming down, pleading ah. Serizawa to come back to the surface with him. Serizawa looks on at Godzilla. These, this man and this monster. Uh -huh. It's going to sound cheesy here, but their fates intertwined. There's no other way within the context of this film that this story could have ended. Absolutely not. And Serizawa wishes Ogata and Emiko happiness as he uh, produces a knife and cuts the rope that binds him to the boat and to safety and to the rest of his life uh -huh. and chooses to perish with Godzilla and with the oxygen destroyer ensuring that having already burnt all his research on the subject the oxygen destroyer will never fall into the wrong hands and be used as a weapon of mass destruction it's one of the most poignant self-sacrifices I have ever seen on film and it resonates with me every time I watch it because Akihiko Hirata playing Serizawa is just brilliant in in this scene. He's brilliant in the whole film, but this scene is the crux of his performance. Absolutely. He he looks at Godzilla and he's not scared. He's not cowering. He's not even got tears in his eye. And and in his eye <laughs> Perfect. In his Where go, yeah. Stephen? <laughs> Show him some respect, please. <laughs> He is a doctor. He died him. for us. <laughs> he lost an eye and died for us. <laughs> um, he looks at Godzilla. He's, there's no fear. There's no hesitation. He isn't back out at the last moment. From the moment he decided to use the oxygen destroyer, he, knew. he knows what he's going to do. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not a decision done on a whim. And Hirata d delivers the line, uh, Ogata, I hope you and Emiko will be happy together. He says it with such conviction that you just... No, Serizawa has known the entire yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Emiko and Ogata have spent so much of the film fretting over revealing their relationship to Serizawa and his how, what his reaction to this is going to be. But he's known the whole time, and he's he understands. He, he understands, and f what I take away from it is that he is reluctantly accepting of it. I'm, no, absolutely. I think he. He wants it's clear he he wants Emiko to be happy exactly, and if she's happy with Ogata, that's fine with him exactly, and it means someone that's going to be less upset when he does what he has to do. Well, there yeah. we go. Um, but no, absolutely fantastic, and what I love so much is that we end this film on sort of Serizawa's final fat sacrifice, which is so great, and I was just so compelled that entire time. And, but, had you said to me, had you pointed out Serizawa in the scene where the ship is leaving for Odo Island, yes, he had you gone, and sunglasses, yeah, so. had you pointed me out and gone, Ross, that's going to be the character at the end that you're really, really rooting for, yeah. I'd be like, really? Because in that scene, yeah, he's, he's, uh, the Odo Island expedition is, is waving everyone off and it's really cheery and enjoyable and then we just see this character standing in a sharp black suit and sunglasses and with what looks like an eye patch underneath and... Uh, again, were this uh, a Western film of the same era, you would say, okay, there's our villain. Exactly. And I, I sort of very much yeah. initially sort of assumed so. But, um, Government agent, something like that. Something like that, yeah. But he absolutely becomes the polar opposite and he is absolutely the hero of the film. And so iconic, like we've, like we've already said. Exactly. My other favourite thing about his costume is how high his trousers are. He does have some <laughs> high He is are. really heeking those up. <laughs> well, I, I don't have too much more um, to say right off the top of my head about Godzilla, but I do want to ask you one question, Stephen. Fire away. Do you remember the first time you saw Godzilla? This film in particular? Yes. I do. Um, oh, let's see now. It would either have been late 2000, maybe early 2001, mm -hmm. maybe, um, because I became a Godzilla fan in August of the year 2000. Stephen Origins. <laughs> <laughs> Kaijusaurus Origins, Stephen. Um, so yes, I... I'm relatively confident saying I would have seen this in the later months of the year 2000. I can't tell off the top of my head because 
I saw this uh, on, I believe the BBC showed it. They did, they actually showed one of these films, which never actually ever do anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, old. And I think it was on quite late at night, so my dad recorded it for me. And thankfully, it was this version. Because unlike, I think, a lot of fans, I am so glad I saw this version before I saw Godzilla, King of the Monsters, which I wanted to tell you about, Ross. Yes, tell me about it. Two years later, an American distributor picks up Godzilla, comes to the conclusion that this probably isn't going to play so well to American audiences. Quite rightly so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. Prick. Yeah. <laughs> that um, guy, I want his name. <laughs> I want the address of his, I assume, maybe grandchildren. At this point. <laughs> um, so, yes, Embassy Pictures uh -huh. picks up Godzilla, cuts it down to 81 minutes from... What is he from? 87 minutes. Okay. Uh, if I'm right off the top of my head. And... Not only did he cut the film down, uh, remove a lot of the anti-nuclear stuff. It's still there. It's just, it's sort of not not to uh, to bring down American monster movies of the same era, but it brings it down to sort of just uh, a plot convenience. Ah, nuclear as plot and not nuclear as allegory. Yeah, not. Um, so not only did they trim it down, remove a lot of the nuclear stuff. They also rearranged scenes all over the place and added in new scenes. With who? With popular American TV <laughs> detective Raymond Burr. TV's <laughs> Raymond Burr from TV's Ironside and TV's Perry Mason. Um, to be fair though, um, if you're going to chop up a film and add new scenes to it, this is how to do it because admittedly, it's well done. Uh, Raymond Burr plays... Uh, a journalist called Steve Martin. Excellent. <laughs> called well, Steve Martin. I know who I'm casting who... in the remake <laughs> of the remake. <laughs> uh, Steve Martin is on his way back from Cairo and stops off in Tokyo mm -hmm. to visit his old college friend, Dr. Serizawa. Excellent. Um, and it follows the same plot of the film, but from a completely different cultural and character perspective. We follow the journalist Steve Martin as he makes his way through Godzilla's Rampage. He meets Serizawa, he meets Emiko, he meets Ogata, he meets um, Yamani through um, body doubles and editing. Ah. Uh -huh. Which, again, if you're going to chop down a film and edit it up, this is... It's well done. And... I mean, this version of the film launched Godzilla into the global market. Uh, at least made people aware, you know, it made people aware Absolutely, of it, I yeah. take it then. Um, but I'll actually forever th be thankful to Raymond Burr because he didn't just treat it as, you know, an easy job, you know, oh, I'm just going to do a couple of scenes for this or anything like that. He went on to be a lifelong uh, fan of Godzilla and 30 years later, was edited into another film. Excellent. And you will see this film. Yeah. He was edited into this film again 30 years later. Uh, the intentions of the producers of this edit in the 80s was to make it a, a comedy along the lines of uh, Woody Allen's What's Up Tiger Lily. Like take yeah, a Japanese so it's, film, strip up. it down, put comedy scenes in it with American actors. And Raymond Barr said, no, if I'm doing it, Godzilla's serious, uh -huh. and it has to be anti-nuclear. Well, that's good. So That's really good. Good man, Raymond. Good man, Raymond. Yeah. Um, I'm quite curious to see that. It is it is worth a watch, because... And, it, and to, it doesn't fall in our official list, not at all. And for what we'll be viewing? Yes. No, I wouldn't say so. It's, it would be more like episode 1.5. Well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I digress. How did I get onto this subject? Well, <laughs> did you ask a question? Well, listeners, if you want to find out how Stephen got onto the subject, <laughs> just move your little cursor back to zero. <laughs> Listen again and uh, just let us know. <laughs> but to bring it back to when I first saw Godzilla, uh -huh. I first saw it on a VHS recording of a BBC broadcast. Relatively confident saying it was late 2000, in the last few months of the year 2000. And... 
I was seven years old at the time. Mm-hmm. Eight years old, sorry. Um, if it was later in the year, I would have been eight years old. I liked the film, but I mean, a lot of it went over my head at that age. Ah. Um, the films I'd seen prior to this were a lot more of the uh, action oriented, and they had other monsters. Yeah, they had monsters but you were you were you were into kaiju movies by this point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. No. So obviously, maybe it was a little. It just wasn't quite clicking for you at that moment in time as a as a film for you as a seven year old. But you you were definitely into that world. Yes, and absolutely. That, and that style. But um, yeah, just just to sort of bring this whole thing to a conclusion, it's so I watched it maybe uh, a lot of my later childhood is just a lot of these films on repeat for as yeah. long as I can remember, and I, I must have watched this film plenty of times when I was little. But there was a period of. A good few years where I didn't watch this film, like not consciously deciding not to watch it or saying, oh, I'm not watching that one or anything like this. But I think maybe again when I was around 14 or 15, maybe, maybe 14, probably 14, I, I got the BFI DVD release and... I watched it, and everything clicked. Really? Absolutely everything clicked. Everything just fell into place, and it was honestly like watching it for the first time again. Ah. Um, Like watching a film I'd never seen, because even just those few years between first seeing it and seeing it through the BFI release, just... He's doing I mean, it again. <laughs> <laughs> every time I watch this film, and I mean every time, my appreciation for it just grows. It's one of these films where every viewing of it, I notice something different. Uh. I notice something new that makes me love it even more. And my love for this film is genuinely impossible for me to put into words. All I can say is that this is the film that has made me want to get into film. It makes it makes me want to be a filmmaker. It makes me want to write about film. It makes me want to be part of that world. It it's absolutely without a shadow of doubt my favorite film of all time and I am absolutely confident it will remain that for the rest of my life. I mean it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I I am so glad I got the chance to watch this. I'm very glad I got the chance to discuss it with you right after. Mm-hmm. I really like this film. Uh, going in fresh into Godzilla, I thought this was an absolutely fantastic film. I was just so blown away, honestly, by by so many different things. I was absolutely like, carried through this film. It just carried me through with such ease. It all the right points clicked for me. It clicked for me. I thought it was a great film, and I, I obviously. I am going to come at it from a different way. I don't have the same sort of um, context of kaiju movies and the same the same sort of passion for them. Mm. I, but I thought this was a great movie, and I, I I think I did indeed like it for like a lot of the same reasons that you did. Good, good film. My final word in this film is that it's an incredible example of collaborative cinema because to me this film has no one author. It's Produced by legendary producer Tomoyuki Tanaka, directed by Shiro Honda, music, music, music. We, get we haven't us. even talked about music by Akira Ifukube, special effects by Eiji Subaraya, and all of, written by Takeo Murata, and all of these men at the absolute peak of their talent, bringing bringing all their talent together to just produce this thoroughly and completely brilliant work. It belongs to no one in particular, and it's a superb example of collaborative cinema. Agreed. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I thought this was great, and I can't wait to watch the next one, to be honest. Good. The next one... 
which if you're listening to this, I really hope you should know what the next one is. The next one is Godzilla Raids Again. But how, <laughs> Stephen? I I'm thought, so I thought, <laughs> wait, a, wait a minute, whoa, I, th- I thought he died. Hmm, that's something to think about. <laughs> Thank you for listening. See you soon. Cheerio.